where we typically work with developers isn't prime CBD locations where they're building massive towers. It's in fringe suburbs, it's in beachside locations, it's a smaller kind of development. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas, and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello, and welcome to episode 79 of the show. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing? All your projects on track? I'm doing well. Been a very busy start to the year, actually. A lot going on, which has made the start of the year fly past. Got a great show coming up for you today, a conversation on a topic that we haven't covered before. But just before I get to that, here's a quick update on my projects. So construction is well underway on my first project. In fact, we're probably about halfway through. We've got roofs going on, we've got plastering starting, and I've spent a busy couple of weeks finalizing the variations with the builder, which is always a bit of a tedious and time-consuming process. Sales have continued to be strong on the project, which is good, and we've only got two more townhouses to go, so that's pretty exciting. On my other project, we're still working on appointing a builder for the project and we have just launched our sales campaign. So hopefully we can pick up a couple of sales uh, in the next few weeks just before the home builder grant runs out. It seems that market sentiment is pretty strong at the moment and hopefully that will continue throughout the year because it's looking fairly promising on the property front. On the training and mentoring side, I've continued to chip away at my online training program, but I've been slightly delayed because of how busy I've been uh, at the start of this year with, uh, with the projects. But I'm making progress there. If you are interested in uh, seeing how ready you might be to become a property developer, head over to www.propertydevelopertraining.com and take the short quiz to see how ready you are. Also, we've got the mentoring program that's available if you want to get started in developing and have someone guide you through the process. If you're interested in learning how to develop, then email me, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com and I'll send you some further information. Now, if you'd like to see how my projects are progressing, I do post regular video updates on the show's Facebook and Instagram feeds, along with other news and tidbits. And they're both under the handle of Property Developer Podcast. So be sure to go and check them out. All right, on to today's guest, David Whelan from Urban Rest. So Urban Rest provides corporate longer stay travel accommodation. Now, the reason that we're talking to David is because he has been doing a lot of work with developers to adapt some of their projects to suit this style of longer term accommodation. So in this conversation, we cover how you can repurpose some of your existing projects without too much variation to create cash flow generating assets, which you can hold for a longer period of time. We talk about why this might be beneficial to you and the project, what locations are suitable for longer stay accommodation, and whether this might be a model that you might want to consider using. It's an interesting conversation about repurposing projects when conditions change and I think you'll enjoy what we discuss. I started off by asking David what food he would eat until he was sick, and his simple response surprised me a little. <laughs> Probably um, some sort of seasoned, but otherwise relatively plain chicken. Um, I'm an absolute chickenaholic. Um, so that would probably be my, yeah, weirdly food of choice. I do have a bit of a sweet tooth and eat chocolate, but unfortunately that would make me probably sick too soon. So if I only had one thing to survive on, yeah, definitely chicken. Well, David, we're here today to talk about your business, Urban Rest Apartments, which is primarily focused on short stay accommodation. And I think we're going to focus particularly on how you've seen a lot of projects being converted into these sort of short stay apartments. So can you give us a bit of a background about uh, how you got into this sector? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, just to clarify up front, it's not predominantly short stay. Um, I would say we do a mix of everything from short through medium and long, um, which is kind of inevitably why we've ended up going towards the, I guess, the property development market with kind of full size units versus, you know, typical commercial 
developer who's building those kind of smaller hotels. But um, to give you a bit of background, um, I you know originally came from a, a finance background. I traveled a lot for work and had a lot of people traveling to Australia that I worked with. Um, and over long periods of time, the one thing we realized was that it can be very soul destroying staying in you know, either the old school um, service apartment offerings or else in a hotel room where you're kind of cooped up and you don't have space to cook or anything. So um, I wanted to go out and do something different. And that for me was an obvious pain point in the market for colleagues that I had. Um, was to go out and try and make larger, more comfortable spaces for people to stay in while they were traveling for work. So um, we started this, you know, me driving around in a U with picking up secondhand furniture and picking up single leases. And since then, it's kind of evolved into picking up some you know, reasonably high-profile corporate clients and getting into bigger and bigger lines of stock and now pursuing the, the kind of full building model, which is kind of operated like a pseudo-hotel um, probably, you know, typical closest to just a service department offering, but with much more of a focus on automation and design, you know, to help improve mental health. And, but also, most importantly, is the kind of larger living spaces that we get through residential developments that typically commercial developers don't focus on. So that's why we've really gone after that smaller size residential development market. And and by using kind of automation and stuff like that, it's actually allowed us to, and, and not having an on-site infrastructure requirement like front desk staff and food and bev offerings, um, it means we can actually open up that market to smaller developers that normally wouldn't have the potential to get those commercial level returns, either be that through a long-term you know, 10 to 15 year lease um, or actually an operating agreement where um, we kind of you know, share the returns with them and they can make much higher yields. And we're trying to really open that market up to the smaller developers who aren't building in a 70 plus room um, or unit developments. And so can you give us a bit of a flavor of the size of the organization and where you're operating? Yeah, look, I mean, it's fluctuated drastically. We've obviously been pretty much on the front line of COVID offering corporate accommodation. You know, we lost about 90% of our revenue in the space of about two weeks back in March when COVID first hit. Um, so we were we were growing pretty rapidly. We're about four years old now, and we were growing um, extremely rapidly over the first three years of that. We, as of kind of March, we had low, um, offices in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra, and Adelaide. And when COVID hit, we had to drastically resize the business just to actually make sure we survived. So we dropped from you know a headcount of twenty something now back down to in the you know, kind of 10, 11 staff, we had to cut pretty quick um, and deeply, unfortunately. And this is obviously dragged on longer than we've expected, but the market's rebounding pretty strongly now. We're back on the kind of growth path. It seems like there's a, you know, Australia at least is a reasonable prospects of getting out of the, the COVID nightmare reasonably soon from a tourism perspective. So we're now trying to get back on the growth path and plan, plan expansions into next year. Um, but so organization size, we're, we're back to, you know, I think at the moment we're hiring, but we're back to about 10, 11 full-time staff. Still have locations in each of those areas, but just significantly smaller than we were this, this time from six months ago. And so are you forecasting that there will be more people wanting to go into the sort of accommodation that you would be offering? Yeah, look, I mean, we had been actually experiencing really strong um, tailwinds pre-COVID anyway. And a lot of those factors we think are going to accelerate as a result of it. Part of our offering is, uh, is the fact that we have full-size units where people can actually you know, unpack and live in for longer periods. And with the, one of the key aspects of that is going to be having um, home office spaces. So a place that people can work from home. And I think even as, like, in terms of whether or not travel or return, yes, of course it will. And, People can't do everything over Zoom indefinitely, um, as convenient as it's been. So that, I think the international travel will take, uh, you know, I don't think that's going to recover properly until end of 2021, if not 22, before that gets back to what we would consider normal levels. But we think people who are traveling will travel for longer because they may have to quarantine, depending on you know how the vaccine plays out. Um, and it's generally going to be more difficult. So we think when people travel, it will be for longer. 
Um, and when they do travel, they'll probably want a flexible option around not necessarily having to be in the office every day, as you see, kind of working from home, becoming more normal. So having those larger spaces and dedicated kind of, you know, working areas, we think will play in perfectly into the model that we've been building. Um, <clears throat> it also, there's also, you know, we think domestic tourism obviously is going to increase over the next you know, 12 months anyway, until international travel and holidays can resume. So we have where we typically work with developers is in prime CBD locations where they're building massive towers. It's in fringe suburbs. It's in beachside locations. It's a smaller kind of development anyway. So that also does is really attractive to that market. So we can cater to a mix of both. As we get the higher paying and higher budget corporate travel coming back, we can take that what we can, but we can also offer that to you know, the domestic kind of staycation market of the next while. So as domestic borders, if they stay open and assuming they there is more domestic travel now over the next couple of months, um, yeah, we think we've got a number of areas that we can take advantage of that to really maximize income both for us and for our partners um, and grow the business, you know, with, while keeping that demand levels high enough to sustain a reasonable occupancy level. So can you talk to us about how you first got involved with um, working with developers and taking their whole buildings and how that basically works? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it evolved definitely. Um, as I touched on, we started off doing single units and then we went to multiple units within single building. Um, I mean, it's obvious from our model and how our business runs perspective and the efficiencies that you get when you have multiple uh, well, effectively like rooms within a hotel. So where we consider units within a building, it gives you kind of flexibility to shuffle people around on the calendar and maximize the occupancy rate. But it also, you know, when you have housekeeping staff, there are all that kind of stuff. There's multiple efficiencies. And obviously you see this at a much larger scale in a full hotel. So as we started experiencing that more and having requests from our clients to have you know, a group of four or five people who were all coming over to be located in the same building. And um, we started moving to more towards looking for, okay, can we actually find developers who've got something that isn't going to be so overly capital intensive from our perspective? You know, we weren't necessarily looking for 60 unit buildings that from day one we wouldn't have the capacity to take on, but can is there a middle ground where we can find a developer who can give us an entire building? So you know, there's no strata issues, there's no neighbors who aren't happy with the fact that it's, you know, maybe more of a transient, even if it's a longer term, but they're not, you know, kind of getting to know their neighbors properly. And obviously, you see a lot of negative publicity around that Airbnb type model. So the, the challenge was to find developers who could bring us that kind of product where we could have control over it and get those efficiencies, but also actually make it financially viable because generally you need a, a you know above kind of 70 rooms typically for like as a hotel to make it work so that's where we really started to go well if we introduce more technology to make this more efficient and don't need people on site and we had gotten good pretty good at this because of how the model worked by being scattered around the place anyway and so we really just tried to tie that in and bring that to a more kind of industrial level i guess for lack of a better term um um, and offering hotel level services, so partnering with companies like Uber Eats and Deliveroo and putting you know, an in-room tablet so that people could come in and they could get effectively all the facilities you get from staying in a hotel to be able to put that in, a, in an apartment unit and without needing all of that on site. So we use effectively outsourcing it. So we tapped into a network of, um, it was it was essentially just the network of contacts we had from our existing investors within the business and people that we knew who were able to put us in touch with smaller scale developers with maybe blocks of 10 to 15 and um, who had the balance sheet to hold it themselves who it wasn't building a product to sell and um, but they actually built a hole and would hold i would normally lease them anyway if we found it difficult at the start when we hadn't really proven out the model yet to get those kind of developers to come on board, even through going, I mean, there was challenges going through real estate agents because they would want that cut, which we do offer them. Um, but it, it has been a challenge to really find those smaller size developers. And by small, I mean, you know, anywhere from five to 10 units in a building up to, you know, 40 or 50, 
but a lot of them are quite private individuals who build these to hold them themselves and there's no easy way to get in touch with those people um but having said that we're finding more and more success we're starting to find as our brand gets known and what we can offer to developers the words sort of get out of it um but that's effectively how we're now trying to source more of these our goal is to have a pretty good network of small to medium sized residential buildings that we will you know convert where possible um scattered around non typical you know middle of cbd locations and um, that we can offer to a mix of commercial of corporate and residential tenants or um, and so that's really the what we've been doing i guess over the last 6 months in particular while things have been a bit quiet so David, a couple of years back, the market softened up. So did you see more interest and opportunities with those developers who were doing projects that they probably designed as built to sell that maybe then were converted into build to hold and leased out to your organisation? Look, we're, we're quite location focused in that we only want to take on so, I mean, particularly if we're taking a lease commitment over, you know, we're, we're very focused on only going into markets where we know there's demand for it. I think a lot of what we've seen, the softening in those markets were typically in very, where you had, a, you know, a large buildup of supply coming through um, in kind of large towers or large developments that weren't necessarily the, the kind of what our core market will be looking for. So, you know, be it... And, and, Close to airports, you know, you would see development size is increasing. And I think that's where you saw most of the softening in the market. So it didn't really impact us because that wasn't what we we're looking for anyway. The areas that we typically go after, which are fringe suburbs, kind of the areas that people want to live in anyway, where it's probably lower density. Um, they weren't really challenged by that. There's kind of been a consistent level of demand. Um, so I don't really think it impacted the level of opportunities we were getting. I think the biggest impact has probably been the quality and the capitalization that goes into the buildings that are originally built to sell versus to lease. You know, I think generally, depending on if you're targeting an investor or an owner occupier market, I guess, particularly if you're targeting the owner occupier market, you know, typically of the much higher level of finishes, um, which doesn't translate very well into, you know, rental stock effectively because the price of expectations for it are reflective of the cost that's gone into it so the yields just come i mean yields on residential yields anyway are so low as it is you know if you're putting in high quality finishes to appeal to an owner occupier market it's going to be very difficult to capture that if you're looking at mass market rentals so i think that's going to be when we're talking now in particular to developers at an early stage in a project and now you know, quite a few of the developers we've worked with and partnered with previously are kind of looking for new sites to develop and we're in various stage of those projects. The big thing is making sure we put in a level of fit out that is good enough, but not overcapitalizing because obviously everyone's, they can then maximize their yields. We can keep our costs, our lease liability costs down or if we're operating it for them, you know, they can get the best possible return. So I think that's the biggest challenge is setting the expectations of what is required in terms of it has to be executive level level quality but that's pretty easy to achieve by just putting in good quality stuff that you know and then we focus on the design aspect around it to sell the product versus putting you know super high-end kitchens and marble bench tops and stuff like that so that's really where we've seen the main transition from from developers who have the who are looking to sell their product versus to hold and lease. It's just really the level of fit out and the capitalization that goes into it. And what kind of lease period or term do you ideally look for initially? Look, historically we were doing, you know, almost typical residential leases where we're doing one to two years minimum commitment. And that was, you know, it was a, a matter of our own transition into figuring out what areas would work. Yeah, we're, we're now kind of moving into the five to ten year lease cycle type thing or you know a five plus five type thing so it really depends on if it's a commercially zoned building where we can do a commercial lease structure versus a you know a residential approval where we have to enter into a residential structure so it kind of it, it's it's quite property specific and, and circumstance specific but generally definitely moving towards more of a, a longer term commitment for you know for the benefit of both parties 
And so how do you decide which areas you would secure or you'd have buildings? We look at overall market data um, in terms of where there's demand, where there's pricing and um, information available, both against our own historical information about what's worked within our portfolio and then within the broader market. So that'll be looking at everything from hotel, current hotel rates versus, you know, hotel stock that's coming on. And um, so it's like, well, is competition here going to increase? Um, and then that is you kind of, you know, the two sides of the equation is what's the revenue potential versus what's the cost going to be. So um, the cost thing is typically how, in what areas are you going to pay a premium for the stock that you're getting? So, you know, if you want to be oceanfront down at Bondi Beach, for example, you're going to pay significantly higher rent than you would if you were, you know, maybe even 500 meters back from the beach. So it's really looking at what are the rates that can be achieved versus what is the underlying cost going to be? And then finding how do we maximize um, that difference between them to both for ourselves and for the developers. So um, co underlying cost um, and then demand potential are really the two big driving factors. Um, and then obviously we work up, you know, where we see our clients, if they point to specific areas of demand, like, you know, we've had a number of clients who said Parramatta for them going forward is going to be an area that they will need more stuff as either they look to move their offices or they've got large projects going on out there. So we kind of listen to our customers a lot um, and our clients. It's sim that's also what's pushing our move into New Zealand. Um, is, uh, from, you know, anecdotally and then having gone over to check out some sites, there's not a whole lot of quality stock available in that area and typically the corporate clients we have struggle to find um, suitable uh, certainly for longer stays they struggle to find suitable options so we kind of just listen to our clients a lot of the time and we'll say okay well if we can make the economic stack up and we know there's demand coming through well you know that's where we'll then go out and put the feelers out and try and find new developments new developers to work with yeah. so you're looking for people to partner with or for projects to uh, take over or to lease from? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got a pretty decent pipeline already for 2021 and then some already into 2022, but we're, we're currently in the middle of trying to do a reasonably significant capital raise. And it's probably, you know, pretty bottom of the cycle from a tourism and hospitality perspective. So we think if we can raise capital now and put it to work, there's a significant level of upside that can be achieved for that over the, you know, particularly the medium term. So uh, with the growth ambitions we have are nowhere near the level of pipeline that we currently have. So we're absolutely looking, you know, not just Sydney and Melbourne, but all of the states we operate in. We're looking in Perth, we're looking for New Zealand and Sunshine Coast, anywhere where there's really opportunity for a corporate travel market, which can include things like, you know, the film industry and entertainment. It doesn't necessarily need to be corporate from a, you know, financial services point of view. We're looking at a lot of different locations at the moment and we're going to have, you know, capital behind this, which we can put to work. So, yeah, if um, we're absolutely looking for opportunities at all stages of pipeline development, both things will be completing soon or that are, you know, only in planning stages and we can continue to build that out for the next two to three years. And so is it just apartment projects that you're interested in or in some of those outer area, I mean, outer areas, I mean, you mentioned the Sunshine Coast, but perhaps yep. some denser townhouse projects, would that be suitable? We are currently looking at, we've got a number of townhouse projects that are actually in the pipeline at the moment that we're working on. So again, it's really, I mean, we kind of think about who the market will be and what will be the most suitable projects. So for example, Port Adelaide, is an example that we've got quite a decent pipeline of stock coming through and a lot of those are actually townhouses you know we've got clients down there in the defense industry who are working on a big subs projects so their typical staff are europeans coming over to work on them for six to twelve months um, and a lot of the times they come with their families so we do you know where we think there's a, a, a quite a lot of density of work force and you know it, it makes sense that it's not like, for example, like, you know, a single consultant type thing who wants to be in Surrey Hills, a townhouse development probably isn't going to work because it's a much more of a, you know, young professional type market of people traveling for work. Whereas if you're looking in, in, in different regions, like Sunshine Coast is a great example as well. And even around Brisbane, you see a lot more 
families moving through projects that they'll be working on. So it's, it's obviously not limited to apartment stock. Um, and we are looking for, I mean, we also, we, I mean, we do single houses as well. And, um, we, you know, we've got quite a large client base that's, you know, could be in need area from three to four bedrooms. Um, particularly in, I mean, in parts of Sydney, as you go into, and, and apologies for, you know, more national listeners for me using Sydney's example, it's where I'm based, so it's what I know the best. But like parts of the North Shore in Sydney around Mossman um, and Neutral Bay, when you start coming out, that aren't necessarily typically obvious areas that you would think this model would work in. Areas where, you know, you have, I guess, an executive kind of people that just live there typically as the usual tent residents are also in huge demand because a lot of the time they'll get recommended. So, you know, be it in you know, Melbourne or in Torak or South Yarra um, and in, in Perth, you get people wanting to go more and, um, you know, kind of towards the coast or in the Subiaco area. And it's, there's a market there for people who are relocating to Australia, which is a huge part of our business. They're coming with their families. Um, and they are getting recommended where there's where they're going to be close to local schools, where you know other people that are at an executive level within their company live, and that's typically where you see the recommendations are. So these are often low density areas where either you know townhouses or housing stock and um, or small scale developments are more the norm as opposed to high density stock, and that's a massive part of our market as well. So we're really very open to kind of exploring any opportunities and if we think it can work you know we'll work with them if we don't we'll be very upfront because the last thing we want to do is deal with people and promise them things and then not be able to deliver on it you know i'm a very firm believer in a relationship type business as opposed to transactional and um, because i think if you screw someone over once that will spread very quickly and you know you, you only have one reputation so we only really work with developments and developers who we think we can have a long-term relationship with and then we can do projects in future so you know if anyone comes to me with questions um if we don't think it'll work we'll be completely upfront with them about it um, and you know potentially there'll be other opportunities that they might have in future which will work but we um we're open-minded in what we take on and um, but we're quite disciplined as well so um yeah i mean there's no one area that i would point you to say only come to us if you've got a you know, a 15 unit apartment building, you know, there's a lot more we can go up to 100 plus units and we can go down as far as single occupancy. So. One final question for you just about the leasing and building model, just in terms of the impact that it has regarding pre-sales for funders and construction finance. What What's the relationship there or how does that work? Yeah, so look, I mean, we've, it makes it a lot easier for the development partners that we have for them to get to get the financing that they need when they've got a, a committed lease up front. It depends on the structure that we go with in terms of the levels of the kind of LVR that they can get on it. So, I mean, if we put in place a, a solid five-year, you know, lease commitment at a, a fixed rate, they can borrow against that very easily. If we put in place an operating agreement um, or kind of a revenue share agreement, which will give them more potential upside, and um, so they actually, you know, share in the benefits of the additional income we're making from it, generally the funding options are slightly more difficult to come across. So banks, as always, want certainty um, in, in those kind of things. So it's it's one of those kind of contradictory things where we're like, well, we can actually get you more money, but the banks will lend less on that because of the uncertainty involved in the risk. Um, although having said that, we have started seeing now a couple of um, financing partners come to the table and accept that as we're building our track record and being able to show that we can, you know, from other developments we've done, where we can pull that history and then show here's what we can earn on a development versus what they would earn on a longer term typical residential lease and they're actually being able to leverage that into a higher borrowing capacity so we've seen a couple of lenders and i mean i won't you know name them here and if anyone's talking to me i'm happy to you know refer or recommend them but we're definitely starting to see a, a, a movement towards as we build up our own track record lenders being willing to lend more on the potential income that a property can earn under our model versus you know risk adjusting that down because there's you know higher occupancy risk. 
But having said that, yeah, banks will always love certainty. Um, so, uh, and definitely putting a five-year lease in place, I think, with the entire building taken, makes it extremely easy for a developer to get the funding that they need. Very good. Well, if people want to find out more about you or about Urban Rest, where should they head, David? Um, look, I would say our website. I would say our social media pages. Um, our, our website is links through to contact. You know, probably the best thing to do is just get in touch. Someone will reach out to them, me probably, um, and we can send over more information. We can you know, send through, um, you know, examples of what we've done, case studies, all that kind of stuff, and then we can just pick up any conversations from there. Fantastic. Well, David, it's been great to talk to you about a topic that we haven't covered before on the podcast. So I wish you all the best with the growth of Urban Rest. I hope you get to partner with some good projects and good developers. Thanks, Justin. I really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.